Check. One, two, three. The D. Three. Three. Yeah. This is the D. Three. Go. Your guide to Detroit. Your guide to Detroit's arts, arts and entertainment scene. This is the D. Three. Welcome to the podcast. I'm your co-host. My name is Seth Ressler. And I'm Becky Scarcello. And joining us again today is Josh Adams, stand-up comedian, very funny guy. In fact, he is the funniest undiscovered comedian in Michigan, according to Thrillist. But he's not going to be in Michigan long. He's nope. taken off. Yes, and he's not undiscovered anymore. And he's not undiscovered. He's he's going to L.A. to, mm-hmm. to prove that. A couple last uh, opportunities to see him, the Redford Theater. Yep. Uh, that's happening when? Uh, that's the 25th of, uh, 25th of January. And then the Independent in, in Hamtramck, this little, uh, they basically took this part of Planet Ant yep. and turned it into a comedy club. Yeah, and I love it because, you know, at Planet Ant is improv, and it used to be a beef between improvers and comedians, mm-hmm. like stand ups, like the Bloods and the Crips. And <laughs> they figured that out, and for them to be like, hey, yeah, y'all can have a little, y'all can have a spot in here to do comedy, and that club is very, like, it's fast. It's fast the way it's coming up. Like, I've never seen them like that. And it's, it's ran by all comics. Right. So they just putting on great shows. I'm there on the 30th. It's my last show at Independent. And um, they actually, we finna sell the first one out, and we're going to be adding a second show. So I feel good. Ah, good, good. So speaking of that whole improv versus plan kind of thing, mm-hmm. when you're performing on stage, it looks to me like you're just having a good time and making it up as you go. But I know that can't be true. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> what's your process? Um... I just like to have fun up there, so it's like, it's, it's if I feel like I'm doing like, I mean, I hate a lot of my jokes. I don't, the reason I hate them is because I just get tired of them after a while. Like, I mean, they still work. They work really well, but it's just like I kind of get bored with them, so I will go on stage and improvise a lot. And, I mean, it's some shows you might see me all legit when I just improvise 100% of it, but in reality, you got to have a set, so... I've learned how to make my set sound as if I'm improvising it while improvising. So I'll be up there making up stuff, and then I'll just throw in one on, you know, if if something works, where it's like I really don't have no set plan, but I know where to put stuff at because sometimes, you know, I hit a topic and run with it. So so it's like a, you have a menu of things to sort of to call pull on. from. Yeah, like yeah. I've been doing this long enough to where I know what I'm doing. Like I'm, I was always a super funny person, but I had to get good at comedy. And mm-hmm. comedy and being funny are two different things. Like, it's one is more technique, the other is like magic. But once you bring them together, it's just like something you ain't never seen before. So wow. I'm just trying to get better at it. So when we go into an interview, we'll have a list of questions often. Right. And we know it's a good interview if we don't get through the whole list because it means that we're having conversation back yeah. and forth and we're kind of riffing and improvising and going with where it goes. Is that how it is when you do stand-up comedy? Like, That's a, that's a great way to put it, Seth, because I, I, I want audiences to feel like this show was for us. Like, we, you can't see this again. Like, mm-hmm. like, and I make a point to say, like, y'all didn't think y'all was going to hear this when y'all came in here. Like, I might have, whatever that specific thing is, and it's just funny because it's nothing funnier than something that happened in the moment that we all like, wow, this just happened. This is crazy. So yeah. that's just kind of how I feel about it. Like, I feel like the show is better if the flow is natural and everybody like, man, that stuff you said about this was crazy. How did you even come up with that? And I'd be like, I don't know. So I'm having fun just like <laughs> right. they is. I didn't know I was going to say that when I came here. So, and, and I don't want to give away the magic because I've seen you and, and I honestly can't tell when you're improvising and when it's a sure. scripted joke that you've done before. But do you have sort of tent poles in your mind where, oh, I want to open with this or, oh, no matter what happens, I'm going to close with this because I know it works? I mean, it's always like, uh, it's just good to know where you're going. Like, I don't like to tell comedians I make it up because then they try it and it don't work good for everybody. Everybody can't improvise. You know, some people should have a set. Me personally... I go up there and it's like, I just don't feel like saying that. I'm, I'm going to just go up here and fill the crowd out. Like, And a lot of times if you see me at a show, I'm looking around, looking at the venue, looking at the people in the venue. If anything happens, it's like it's weird. Like I got ADD with that. If I see something, I got to go with it. I just cannot not say something. If, if, a, if a beer fall over, I, something going to happen. <laughs> I remember this show, I think it was in Saginaw, now that I think about it, where I saw you mm-hmm. for the first time. I remember watching you and there was like a hole in the ground or something. And... You just went off on it and and about how tiny the place was. And next thing I know, you're sitting there singing the Super Mario theme song. And I, I just remember thinking, oh, my God, like, I don't even know. I didn't know that I was going to do that. See what I'm saying, Seth? So it's like when I just think about it, man, I just walk into a place and I kind of just let whatever happen happen. And I think that's just the best shows. Like, I feel like people have more fun with them. And mm-hmm. I, I'm trying to figure out how to incorporate that. That's what the albums is about me improvising a lot and working on my storytelling because I feel like my special is only going to be good if I can be me. So I don't want to go up there and I got this monologue to say. 
Man. I kind of like, Man. hey, we're going to wing it, but I'm going to get good at it. So good at it that it'll be able to translate to the third person. Like, Because a lot of times, people I can lead a show and be like, he said this, and they were like, well, I don't understand because they wasn't there. You know what I'm saying? But I wanted to be able to translate to a person that's not at the venue and they watching it from home. Right. So when you talk about your album, did you have everything scripted out before you recorded it? Or did that involve some improv, too? No, it's, it's basically like what you said. I, I had some stuff like my album was basically like jokes that I didn't finish. And I was like, I'm going to go up here and see if I can write on stage because that's what I do ah, with a lot of my yeah, comedy. Yeah. So it's like I'm like, oh, OK, I want to talk about, uh, you know, uh, sparkling water so i go on stage and i have a reason to talk about sparkling water and then something might happen somebody might yell something in the crowd and throw something in there because and then it'll, it'll go somewhere and i can take it somewhere like mm -hmm. i can always figure out how to land it you know i can figure out how to land the plane period every time so my album i went in there with like some unfinished toys that i had like little pieces and stuff like that and i went up there and i made it work and I think it was good, and I'm only going to keep getting better at that, working on that muscle. Yeah, when, I think so. When you're an improviser, do you look at other comedians who are really good at improvisation for, you know, like a Robin Williams or something like that mm -hmm. for inspiration and to watch what they do, or do you not? You just, you improvise. I just go up there and improvise because I've been doing it since I was a kid. Like, being funny, like, nobody grew up telling joke jokes. Like, not nobody I know. We just grew up being funny, and right. our funny mm -hmm. was always in the moment on the fly, so that was just a muscle that I didn't even realize that I was working on. Then I started comedy and people was like, you naturally funny, which I didn't get. I still don't understand it, but people are like, you just so naturally funny. And then I was like, okay, but I got to work on the other side of it, which like I said, is the comedian side, really being a good comedian and breaking jokes down and being able to be like, all right, I need to write a joke about sparkling water and I got to figure out where the funny is, in, is in, uh, where it, it, where's the funny located at in this thing that I'm thinking about. So how do you do that? It's so, it's, it's just like, it's just like, I don't know. Like, I really wish. <laughs> it's, it's the magic well, part. Well, how yeah. do you do? I mean, do you write? Do you set aside time to write? I'm are forcing you, myself to now. You are, and mm -hmm. how's that going? It's, it's going good. Like, it's like, okay, I got to understand that I have to sit down and write these jokes out. I have to be like, all right, I, I'm tired of leaving a, 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 a set and people are like, man, you remember that thing you said about forks? And I'm like, nah. They be like, you should record that because mm -hmm. that's a pe that's a joke that I wrote. It might not be done, but once I like, let's say if I improvise it, it's probably sixty percent done. It's funny as is, but it's not a killer yet. I can write it all the way up to a hundred percent and make it that funny joke. But that's just me being lazy. And I was talking to my boys about this when you when you got a talent, you're more lazy because you just can do it whenever. But you got to match that work with the talent to really be good. Mm -hmm. I got to do the work. I get lazy, Seth. Like, I'm like, I know I'm funny. I'll make, I'll make it up. Like I just said, I'll find a way to land a plane. It's like, how about just make sure the plane stay up in the air? <laughs> right. For people who don't know about the world of stand-up comedy, what is the work? The work is grabbing the mics, which I do that, but actually taking the time to write material. Like, people don't know nothing about me. I go up and improvise on what's going on in the world, and then I talk about myself here and there, but it's like, okay, I got to be able to peel those layers back and that's the kind of stuff that make people want to follow you once they feel like they know you. Sure. I leave out people like, that's one of the funniest persons I ever saw. But they will they respond more to a, I used to Kevin Hart for an example. He's somebody who talk about his life. You feel like when you walk up to Kevin, you know him. You walk up to me, you like, you one of the funniest people I've ever seen. And that's about it. And I'm trying to figure out how to give my material more weight. I feel like a lot of my material is like featherweight. Like it's like, I want you to leave and be like, man, that bitch you had about uh, Trump was you know what I'm saying if that's something I feel important to talk about that's what I'm working on but the work is like I said writing I'm trying to write for an hour a day Wow, an hour a day I want to sit down even if it feel like work but I want to get to the point where it's like alright I sat down and I just got in a, I got in a vibe a zone I wrote for three hours and I got some stuff that I can go to New Way and work out and tinker with it and play with this and move these words around because it's all that is important you need all that Sure. I'm sure there's an element of vulnerability. Like mm -hmm. you've been able to be almost like a character, right? Yep. And now if you want to share more of yourself, that's a different kind of openness. So. And that's just what it is. I feel like yeah. when you're a comedian, you're when you're a comedian, you got to be the best version of yourself up there. You got to be you. You can't be nobody else. So we all start off as somebody that uh, I, I'm really a fan of Robin Williams. And you, and you might seem like and act like Robin Williams because to him, to you, that's somebody who was funny. But eventually you're going to shed that skin and become Seth. You know what I'm saying? Or become mm -hmm. me and you become yourself. 
It's like musicians doing cover songs. Like you could do these great versions of covers, but when you're really going to shine is when you do your own material. Yeah, you can play Bob Seger music all you want, but that's mm-hmm. Bob. You yeah. know what I'm saying? You got to do you. Yeah. I, I hear the phrase, finding my voice, sometimes yeah. when comedians talk about this. But this is, you've been doing this a long time. 15 years. Right? Yeah. And so it's an ongoing process. It never stops. Like you never stop trying to get better. Like uh, from, from day one, I'm more closer to being more vulnerable and being comfortable being talking about things on stage than I was before. So I'm getting there, but it's like, man, it just don't ever stop. You want to get better. It's like, all right, I want to get up there and be able to talk about any and everything and it don't matter what it is. Give me an example of something that you talk about now that you wouldn't have talked about five years, ten years ago. Mm-hmm. I mean, now, I, uh, five, ten years from now, like, I mean, I'm thinking I'm getting closer to the space where I'm going to talk more about the relationship that me and my mama got. Like, you know what I'm saying? She's still around, she's still here, but we're not the closest. But that makes me feel a way, so it's like it's not something I'm ready to play with yet. Mm-hmm. But it's something that somebody out there in the audience want to hear because they might not be that close with their mom. So it's like something that people just want to know who you are. It's, I feel like this is deeper than we were supposed to get because <laughs> no. it got quiet and it's supposed to be funny. But every time I come here, I just get to talking and I like being here. So, but you yeah. know what? When, when I played with stand up comedy, one of the things that I remember thinking early on is I suffered a, a really bad injury a number of years ago. Mm-hmm. And I don't have a problem talking about the injury, but I, I kind of knew that it would be, you know, if, if that would be part of it, would be finding the way to talk about this on stage. Mm-hmm. I never got there, but I understand what you mean because it is something that, you know, that for me, that's that's where I'm vulnerable. I mean, yeah, we all got our things, man. Like, I mean, rest in peace to him, comedian Kool-Aid. He, uh, for the long, he had like a... Uh, he had a keloid on the back of his neck and he was the funniest person in the world. He got any women, any woman in the world he got that never bothered him, but he just didn't want to talk about it. It was almost like the elephant in the room. It was like this man literally had like a piece of skin that just was on the back of his neck and we was used to it. We wouldn't say nothing about it and we would joke here and there. But then he got comfortable like the last five or six years and started talking about it. And it was just like, it took him to another level. He was already one of the greatest ever. And it was just like, oh, wow. Now he ain't nothing holding him back. It, that was that one thing. That little thing was holding him back just enough. Mm-hmm. And once he just shared that, he just was like, he was already out of here. He was already super funny. It was just like, oh, nothing, it's nothing you can do with him now. Well, I think it elevates you, too, if you can find that vulnerability and that personality that's mm-hmm. really personal. It's, it's you go from comedian to like a celebrity like it, you know and like someone that people like you said feel like they know and can relate to in a certain way yeah. and and that's a ne- that's next level that's definitely next level so i mean i don't know how we got to here i think what was he talking about doing the work just the process and the work and where you would have talked like you probably wouldn't have talked about fatherhood you know i wouldn't have i'm a would, father now yeah, and so. in my relationship with my daughter's moms i got two of them two beautiful women that hate me but that's cool <laughs> Well, Seth has more than that. Yeah, I I can only get one. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? So it's like those things happen. But when the bag drop, they'll be straight and then get them a little reality TV show and then do what you do. (laughs) But it's just like those things that we talk about that's personal, that's a part of the game, man. Like you can be funny, but they they connect when they really know you because people want to relate to what your struggle is. Mm -hmm. All right, guys, let's uh, talk about what's going on this weekend, make some recommendations. Becky, let's start with you. Sure. So if you love hockey, you like the Red Wings, but maybe you don't want to commit to a game, the time, the money at LCA, you can still go see some Red Wing alumni players. So there's this thing this weekend called the Frozen Fish Fiasco. What? Yeah. It takes place in Clark Park, which is actually the only maintained outdoor ice rink in the city of Detroit. So, of course, that needs money to maintain. So this is a fundraiser for that. So it's a full two days of games, a lot of youth players. And then, uh, you know, the creme de la creme is the is the Red Wing alumni players going out there. They play each day Uh, like one day they verse a team that's made up of UAW. Uh, employees. So, so what if Darren McCarty just straight up like knock down a kid? Like you know what I'm saying? He just have a flashback. You might see that. Yeah, Darren McCarty's one of the one of the guys who's been involved for a long he time. Do comedy. So does he? Yeah, yeah, he do comedy, he do shows. Yeah, he does. Yeah. He does. So you can check that out. It's at Clark Park and like I said, all the money goes to maintain the rink and to outfit kids in the neighborhood with equipment to play hockey. Oh that's dope. So yeah. And, and that's an expensive sport. 
Yeah. Exactly. Hockey equipment, that's expensive. Yeah, yeah. So you can go for five bucks, or I love this, you can buy a $25 VIP ticket, and you can watch these games from a throne made out of hockey sticks. Man, if y'all don't pay $25, that's amazing. <laughs> that is. I want to do that. That's like uh, Game of Thrones, but with hockey with sticks. With hockey yeah. sticks, and they'll bring you drinks and stuff. Wow. There's there's beer sponsors. At Clark there. Park. Yeah, Clark Park. I'm going to that for real. Saturday, Sunday, the 25th, 26th, all day long games. I'm going to that after my show. Let's talk about your last show here in town. It's going to be over uh, in Hamtramck at the Independent, the comedy yeah, club. Inside of Planet Ant, it's, um, it's, my, it's my last show at the Independent. Um, oh, oh, are there more in the area? When are you actually leaving? When I'm leaving you... February 28th. Oh, so we got some time. Yeah, yeah, I got Come some on. time. But okay. I mean, if you want to see me at the Independent, which is one of the newest upstart comedy clubs in the, in the city, you should definitely go there. Um, Eight o'clock show. It's about to sell out. We're about to add a second one. It's mm. me. Um, EJ Watson is hosting, and I ain't figured out yet who I want to open up for me. But it's just gonna be it's gonna be the creme de la creme. I'm gonna have some of the funniest comedians coming up doing their thing before me, and then I'm gonna close it out and talk. I don't know what I'm gonna say yet, so come. We just told you I would improvise, <laughs> so I don't even know what I'm gonna say yet. It's gonna be magic. We talked a little bit about that club, but tell us more about the story behind it. Uh, it's a it's a comedy club that they opened up inside of an improv, so it's almost like Inception. It's crazy mm. when you think about it, but. It's a little, it's a little, it's like 50, 60 people. It's very intimate. And it's all run by comedians. Bart Dangus, Connor, uh, Joh uh, Johanna does a show over there. Uh, Brett Mercer. It's just some of the best underground comedians that people don't know about yet. Putting together, a, create, like taking the scene and making it stronger and putting a club together where they bring it in. Some of the funniest people around the country that you would not think would come here. You think they would go to Ridley's, which they do. But they want to come to a club that's ran by comedians because it's a freedom with that. It's mm -hmm. just a freedom to come be yourself. It's underground. It's like Rage Against the Machine. It's kind of like we rebelling. Like, all right, we still love really, but it's like we can come over and do what we want to do. When the Detroit Comedy Festival happened last year, they actually invited, uh, I was there at the Independent to give a workshop for comedians okay. about podcasts uh, and teaching them because that's a thing a lot of comedians are doing. Yeah, you right. got one. Yeah, I got one. Most definitely. Josh Adams podcast. Oh, yeah, yeah, Seth, y'all went in there. So like, what did you think of the spot? I, it's cool. It's it's mm -hmm. small. It's intimate. It's, it's small. It's dark. It's like yeah. It's everything it, comedy's supposed to be. It's a great place to see a show, and as opposed to a bar, you know, there's nothing worse than going to a mm. sports bar and there's a football game in the background, and, and they don't it, care nothing about the game. They're about the show. So, and then they got a bigger space in there where, if if they sell it to that point, they got a bigger space. So it's just I love the facility, and they got a bar next door, so you can go over there and kick it, man. So it's cool. Cool. Uh, here's my recommendation: Kermit the Frog is coming back to the DIA. I guess they've had a Kermit for a long time. Okay, Kermit. Yeah, this is a 1969 version of the puppet. Uh, it was donated to the DIA in 1971. Just to give you an idea of how early that is, the Muppet Show didn't debut until 1975. Wow. This is pre-Muppet Show Kermit. Okay, this is an early Kermit. I, and I guess one of the ways you can tell, one of the hallmarks is that, you know, whatever the, what, what is the scruff around the, uh, yeah. the neck Okay, like the collar. Yes, yeah. he's got two of those. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and that's a hallmark of the sign. Uh, Sesame Street actually debuted in 1969, and Kermit was part of that, so he was around back then. Oh, but so they, Kermit lived on Sesame Street, and then he went over. And then he went over to The Muppet Show. Yep. Yeah, the spinoff. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, and <laughs> even, they, they, he was around in incarnations even before Shout that. Shout out Henson. to Kermit on his I Justin know. Timberlake. Yes. So yes. that's something you can see before you go. Uh, yeah. Also, he's, he's going to be there till late March, and they've also got a 1947 Howdy Doody puppet over at the DIA. Yeah, I don't know what that is. <laughs> Howdy Doody. Creepy. Josh Adams <laughs> has got a couple of shows left, and you can always go get the album The Miseducation of Joshua Adams. People Please. can find that anywhere. And Please grab it, man. Yeah, all, all streaming sites and all anywhere they're selling stuff. Anywhere you can buy music or download stuff, you can get it there. Cool. Uh, one thing that we're doing at the end of every show now is that we are inviting local artists, local musicians to submit songs because we're going to close out every episode of the podcast with a song from a local band. Uh, comedians can do this as well. So if comedians like yourself have recorded an album here locally, they can submit a track and we can play it here on included in the podcast. Yeah. All you do is go to the debriefdetroit.com and there's an easy breezy way to do so. So I have a song for you guys today. It's called Underdog. The artist is named Maya Annie. 
She's a singer, songwriter, guitarist, producer. She does it all. She's from Detroit. I love her sound. Um, her mom's from Sierra Leone and her dad is from Detroit. He's Jewish and mm -hmm. he played like rock and roll guitar. Okay. So she comes from this cool like pairing and, and she wrote this song, she says, as an anthem for herself, kind of to, like to pick up her mood because she always sort of felt like an underdog in life. Mm -hmm. And as she's been a musician and writing some things, she she knows that a lot of people relate to that feeling. Oh, so sure. that's what this song is about. I love this song. When the submission started rolling in, I was like, that's the one. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's fantastic a fantastic song. So we'll check it out. And Josh, you'll be back with us tomorrow. Till then, Detroit's moving. Keep up. I'm an elusive person. Maybe overly cautious, but wide as the greatest ocean. And yeah, it can cost you to be silent when they have spoken. To be out of the circle, but part of the circus performing. Maybe I was so foolish to think it, that what's in my head is how you all feel about me. And how can I change what you feel when you already think? You know my whole story and tell it so confidently. Now, how can that be? I am just under. Under the mark, right where the stars fall from their brightest, right under, under the trees, but high as the top, shining, so it makes you wonder if what's in the dark will come to the light, just when you think that they are under, just wait for me, wait for me, just wait. Sometimes I think I'm not chosen Like I don't fit the role Or wear the right clothes I'm soft-spoken And I'm not the type to go out I stay home every evening Working on things that give my life a little more meaning yeah. And you would be foolish to think yeah, That what's in your head about how my life's ending will be Standards determined by numbers and empty receipts But I still have value if I am not making money Now how can that be? Cause I am just under, under the mark Right where the stars fall from their brightest Right under, under the trees But high as the top shining So it makes you wonder If what's in the dark will come to the light Just when you think that they are under just wait for me, wait for me, just wait for me, let's see, whoa, oh, 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 whoa, oh, 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 whoa, oh, 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 whoa, oh, 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 I am under, under the mark, right where the stars fall from the brightest right under. Under the trees, but high as the top, shining so it makes you wonder if what's in the dark will come to the light just when you think that they are under. I am not under. The D Brief, your guide to Detroit's art and entertainment scene.